Okay, we are now on chapter 4, which is uh, speech coding. There are two chapters that is speech coding. Speech coding 1, I'll be doing it. Speech coding 2 will be provided by NICTA people, which is Dr. Julian Epps will be talking about uh, speech coding, second chapter of speech coding. Let's look at what is speech coding and how do we compress speech. Uh, this chapter actually gives you the background to speech coding and its compression techniques and also we'll be looking at a main compression, speech compression technique which is called the KELP, C-E-L-P, KELP technique, which is called the C-E-L-P. So <clears throat> that's the major technique for speech compression. So <clears throat> in speech coding, what we are really interested is to have a lower bit rate but achieving the high quality speech. So normally you know if you take a telephone speech which is eight, uh, um, eight kilohertz sampling rate, eight bits per second, eight bits for each sample, so it's 64 kilobits per second. So normal telephone speech is 64 kilobits per second. It has got a lot of redundancy in it. And we, we can remove the redundancy very carefully. And if you can re remove it, you can achieve really four kilobits per second. And when you play the both signal, reconstructor signal using 64 and also four, perceptually there's no difference. So speech compression, current compression can go up to four. And there's constant quest that we want to go uh, less than 4 kilobits per second, and people are still working on less than 4 kilobits per second. And in speech coders, there are different type of coders available. So basically, there are three classes of speech coders we have. Uh, waveform coders, they work on the waveform itself. And second one is source coders. Source coders are uh, basically how the speech is produced and use the a vocal track uh, model uh, to code the speech, and then hybrid coders, which combines uh, uh, both uh, both waveform coders, source coders. So waveform coders, if you take that one as first, which accept continuous speech signals and encode them digitally, and decoders then will decode the signal and then reconstruct the signal back for you. So that's uh, uh, may, may known as waveform coders. They actually work on the waveform itself. So if this is the waveform, and look at these amplitude and try to code them some more how. Okay, what are the waveform coding techniques available? So waveform encoding techniques are, there are, uh, I mean encoding, we call it encoding. Encoding techniques are PCM, pulse code modulation. And then you have got differential pulse code modulation. You should look at the, some of the text to understand this a bit more in detail. Then adaptive differential pulse code modulation, and adaptively change the uh, step size. And then delta modulation, and then you've got adaptive delta modulation. The, all these techniques are called waveform encoding techniques, and they are time domain technique. They are working on the time samples. And all these techniques has got a counterpart in frequency domain, which is SBC subband coding and adaptive transform coding. We won't be looking at all of these individually. What we are really interested in is uh, the, 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 the speech compression algorithm, which is called the KELP. But just to give you an idea of these are the waveform encoders, you may have already done this in your undergraduate program. So basically, if you just run through very quickly, if you if you consider PCM, and uh, and every sample is uniformly quantized or uh, non-uniformly quantized. If you take a, a signal and uh, quantize them uniformly, there's a step size of delta v, and we know, and from your undergraduate program, we can work out the signal to quantization noise ratio is 6.2 times b. That means every time you increase one bit for representation, your signal to quantization noise ratio increases. That's what's being said here. The signal to quantization noise ratio approximately increases approximately 6 dB for each bit. 
and um, we assume a uniform uh, um, power spectral density function in this case. You can have non-uniform quantization where you can see here the step size are different. That's different size, and that's different size, and that's different size, and uh, and 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 um, that's being the case in normal speech compression. They don't use uniform because the most you need a, a smaller step at a, at a low amplitude and a, and, a, and a larger step in a high amplitude. So you will find this type of non-uniform coders available for PCM. They're well established. They're all available in the textbooks. You can have a look at those. Then the next one is a differential PCM. What is differential PCM? You basically take the current sample and the previous sample and subtract them, and you get the error. We've already come across this error before. And then you do what you do. You code the error. So, and subtraction, this is basically a differentiation, really, though, right? So if you take the transform of it, this is your transform of your, uh, of your error signal. The idea is by subtracting, your amplitude is small, so the power that you need, the amount of power carried in that difference, uh, difference error is so small, so the number of bits required to code that small error is also small. But however, we run into sometimes problems. Let's have a look at it. This is your transmitter. Your signal comes in here, and you delay your signal and subtract them. So that's what you error. You transmit it across the channel, and this is a FIR filter, and then you have a reverse filter, which is an IAR filter, which will cancel out these two, and you get your signal, what's here, back here. That's the, the ideal case. That's what I have written here. Why is that? What's in here is here. That's in the ideal case, okay? However, if you take a, another example here, this is your differential uh, PCM. In the channel, there's certain amount of noise there. Or you can say, leave out that noise, but the quantization noise is already there. And when it goes through the um, through, uh, through the channel and leaving out the channel noise and at the receiver when you're trying to recover the signal you get your signal there as normal plus the quantization noise which is there which could be very small but it's being integrated and people found, uh, found that this integrated noise is more annoying than the quantization noise itself and therefore, we must find a way of canceling out this integration so that you only have the quantization noise at the end. So people worked on various schemes in this differential PCM, and the transmitter has been modified, and the quantizers inside this loop, right, such that the error ESAT become as that, that's your transfer function or, or the transform of ESAT, and when this is being uh, integrated, at the end, what you find, if you, if you just go through this step one at a time, you find output has got signal plus noise. Only the quantization noise. Now you can see the quantization noise is not integrated. Integrated means NQ set divided by 1 minus set to the minus 1. This is, a, this is, a, this is a integrator. It's an it's a IAR filter. And you don't have that. You only have in QSAT. So this particular structure that we have got here allows you to remove that integrating noise, but you are left with the quantization noise. So this is a better structure. This is all differential PCM. And uh, the, the next structure is to... Um, you will find this simple differentiation, like subtracting one sample from the other sample, does not really minimize the error. So we want to find out some sort of different technique where we can actually minimize the error. Okay. You, and what we do is we, we use a predictor here. If you go back to the previous one, you had only a delay. See the delay? Now what I'm trying to do is 
This delay, I'm trying to replace it by a predictor. Predictor is similar to a linear predictor. So you can see I have got PZ. And if you just go through the whole equation again, the output is exactly the same as the previous case. But you find that people have noticed that and the, the, the variance is about 60 dB relative to the PCM that has been recorded. So it's much better by doing this, uh, minimizing the error using a predictor is much better uh, uh, for encoding the signal rather than using a simple delay. Now, what is the, the next step is the uh, um, adaptive differential uh, PCM. And um, in the adaptive differential P PCM, just you have got adaptive prediction. It's a simple linear prediction is what you use. And it has been reported, if you use adaptive prediction, you can achieve more than 12 dB can be achieved from a 10th order linear predictor. So improvement of 12 dB. So that's, that's, that's really good. So a simple adaptive predictor you have here is, what happened here is you, your signal comes in here, right? You have a look at the signal, and then you, you calculate, you do an LPC computation every 10 milliseconds, and you have this coefficient updated. And this is your error. Now, the, one of the difficulties, you need to transmit the side information to the receiver, because earlier case, what we had, if you look at the previous case, what we had is only a fixed uh, uh, predictor, which it doesn't matter which frame you're looking at, the predictor is fixed. But in this case, the next case, you've got an adaptive predictor. Every 10 milliseconds, the coefficients are changing. Therefore, you need to pass that information. So there's an associated overhead with this particular scheme, but it's not very big, it's very small. And this seems to be the better scheme, the adaptive uh, differential PCM, in terms of, in terms of uh, um, uh, signal-to-noise ratio improvement or signal-to-quantization noise ratio improvement in terms of quality, that's better. Summary of waveform coders. In the waveform coders, we have said that you can use um, uniform quantization or non-uniform quantization. Non-uniform is A low or mu low you use. 8-bit compressed data. And if you have got 8 kilohertz sampling, you get 64 kilobits per second. That is the basic one. And differential PCM will give you 32 kilobits per second. And then if you go for adaptive differential PCM, you can have between 24 to 32 kilobits per second. You can go up to 24 kilobits per second. And still it's far away, like we start from 64 with all these techniques, we are only able to get around 24, roughly half. We should be able to go further down. But waveform coders don't provide any other flexibility to bring down the bit rate further down. So we need to look at some other way of uh, reducing the bit rate because everything is about compression. You've got so much data, sample data available, and we want to compress the data so that uh, when you reproduce the speech, uh, there's, there's a, you haven't lost the quality. Quality is still there. Source coders. What are the source coders? Remember I mentioned about source coders? Source coders based on how the vocal tract is modeled and use that one to develop a speech synthesizer or speech compression algorithm. In this case, they use the famous LPC source coder. They use the famous LPC-10. Uh, I'm looking for it. Here it is. LPC-10 is widely used uh, um, uh, uh, speech compression algorithm. 10 stands for 10 LPC coefficient, right? And uh, it has been mainly used by for military communication, and uh, its, its quality is not extremely high, but it's a, it's a reasonably good quality. It's a very low bit rate, and, um, and, and see how it's done. So just to give you a, a um, little bit of a summary to it, LPC-10 algorithm, you have learned about LPC earlier, how to get the LPC coefficients. So LPC-10 algorithm is, uh, is, is, is work, working on, say, 44, um, just I'm looking at one second, 
LPC and then so you what you do in the algorithm is you incoming speech is partitioned to 180 samples and you could ask why it should be 180, why it could be smaller than you can have smaller, but LPC 10 is a standard algorithm which uses 180 samples and they use a 10th order linear predictor and then they have to extract the pitch voicing and they use the AMDF technique which seems to be working very well even during uh, noisy speech, uh, um, uh, for a noisy speech signal. So um, AMDF can be used and then you you implement the LPC-10 algorithm basically and you calculate the 12 coefficients and you don't, as I said to you before, the 12, co uh, 10 coefficients, they all, if you start to quantize them, you will run into a lot of problems. So you translate the coefficients into reflection coefficients, which we have looked at before, which we have called them K, K1, K2, K3. And then you assign how many bits you need for each coefficient. So you got, basically, if you think of it very carefully, you got 10 coefficients, so 10 reflection coefficients, and not each coefficient needs uh, um, 10 bits or 12 bits, depends on their uh, vari uh, variance. So people have found that five bits is needed for K1 first coefficients, uh, one to K2, and four bits for K5 through K8, and then three bits for K9, and, K, uh, and, and, and two bits for K10. So these are just looking at sensitivity analysis of of, uh, of those coefficients by going through going to various uh, uh, speech database and analyzing LPC on that again. Okay. So 41 bits altogether needed to transmit the reflection coefficients. So you need to go back in your notes and see what is reflection coefficient. They can be derived from the LPC coefficient, and then you need seven bits for pitch. Naturally, you know pitch is uh, uh, which is basically um, in the region of 50 hertz to 400 hertz. So 10 bits is more than sufficient to, re uh, to represent a, a pitch. Um, so uh, seven bits is enough in this case, like you know, you've got seven bits. And then five bits for the amplitude. You want to know whether it's a voiced or unvoiced pitch, and you want to know the amplitude as well. So you need five bits. Then one bit is used for synchronization, giving a total of 54 bits per frame. So you can go, uh, basically, you can achieve a 2.4 kilobits per second um, uh, uh, compression uh, from a 64 kilobits per second to 2.4. But the quality is not uh, as a normal telephone quality. It will be less than that. Uh, it's acceptable quality, you can listen to it, you can understand the speech. It's kind of a machine, machine quality, uh, but not, a, not as a uh, telephone speech quality. So LPC-based um, uh, uh, voicing, uh, voc coding, uh, voc coding means designing a coder and a, a decoder, has got limitation that we have to assume the voice is either voiced or unvoiced. You have to decide whether you have to detect the pitch or not to detect pitch. So if you make a decision on that, if you make a mistake on it, what does that mean? If you make a mistake, then uh, there's going to be error. You are going to detect pitch period, which is not there for an unvoiced speech. So your voice to decision algorithm has to be very accurate and it's all sort of problem. So people kind of said like, how do we, how do we, you know, avoid this? And you need to have two excitation, all sort of problems. So they want to find one excitation only, or two excitation, but is in a kind of a different manner. So, but they should be combined and in one particular way. That's how the help coding came into play. So the knowledge we gathered on the LPC coding, LPC 10, uh, led us to develop the help coding. So in order to understand a kelp coding, you must understand the next uh, definition of the coding is a hybrid coding. And what is a hybrid coder? Hybrid coders combines the features from source coding and waveform codings. And there are many hybrid coders people have tried out. One of the famous ones is the analysis by synthesis one. And most of them uh, employ analysis by synthesis, right? 
and a block diagram is given on the next section and I'll now explain what is analysis by synthesis and this is the coder which is actually modified and turned into kelp coding which gives you the best compression which is about 4 kilobits per second with a telephone speech. So you have got a 64 kilobits per second telephone speech and that can be compressed using this algorithm to 4 kilobits per second. You can listen both of them after reconstructing them, they will sound similar, you don't see difference. So you have removed all the redundancy in the 64 kilobits per uh, second uh, um, uh, speech uh, and, and you have compressed to uh, 4 kilobits per second. So let's go into look at analysis by synthesis. What is analysis by synthesis? Okay, this is exactly what happens. You have your signal coming in. You extract some parameters, whatever parameters you want to extract, the LPC and all of those. And then you immediately feed the parameter and synthesize the signal here immediately. So you don't know what's going to come out. You you are now trying to check what you are sending out. Is that correct? So you synthesize the speech, you already have your original speech, you subtract them. And if the synthesized speech is identical to the original one, then the error will be very minimum or small. And use this error to adjust these parameters. So what you will be doing is you will be in this loop for some time until you get the optimum parameter. And then you send the optimum parameter across the channel and then you synthesize them and you get a very good speech. Before, you are analyzing them and send the parameter across and then being synthesized. And you don't know really, you know, you haven't got any control. Now, you extract the parameter, you synthesize locally, and then subtract from the original to synthesize, and if there's an error, use the error to change the parameters until you minimize this error. This different signal has to be minimized. And that's your encoder part of analysis by synthesis structure. And this coder alone will give you a, a, around 10 kilobits per second if you use this technique. But one of the problems you will come across, what's the problem you think is you'll come across here? Because you need to go through this loop a few times, there's going to be a delay inherent. Before you analyze and send them across, there's no delay. Now you are going to go in a loop until you get a better parameter, so that means you're going to be, there's going to be a certain amount of delay, right? But the quality is very high, yeah? So hybrid, hybrid coders, a bit rate is reduced below 9.6 kilobits per second. And, and it is possible by using the structure and doing some modification, you can go below 8 kilobits per second. So the code excitation linear predictive prediction, which is called the KELP coder, provided an improvement of excitation signal. So the excitation, people found excitation for, the, for this uh, encoder is the important part. If you get the correct excitation at the correct time, then your quality is good. If you make a mistake on the excitation, then the quality is not good. So, based on this hybrid coder, this new coder, which is called co code excited linear prediction, was was uh, developed. Okay. So this is the coder. It's the main part that you need to know. You need to know the other bits as well, but this is very important. What is Kelp coder? What is code excited linear prediction? Let's look at speech coding standard first. For speech coding to be useful, uh, telecommunication for applications, that it has to be standardized. So you can't just develop a speech coding algorithm and say, this does this particular job, and this is what it does. It, once you develop an algorithm, it has got to go through a standard test. And what test it has to satisfy being, being, being standardized? and the ITU are responsible for standardizing the standards. Um, IT was formerly called a CC, yeah, ITT, and then European standards are called ETSI. 
So what are the ITU standards? For example, if you look at ITU standard, it was uh, in G71112, 64 kilobits per second. That was a standard algorithm available. And you can actually buy that algorithm, or you can actually look at the web, and if it's available free, you can download them and use them. 32 kilobits ADPCM, that's the end of the standard. Going back in time, it was, uh, it was approved. 16 kilobits per second is a low delay kelp uh, uh, algorithm, and that uh, is called G728. It's a low delay kelp. And then 729 was 8 kilobits per second. It's a called conjugate structure algebraic kelp. It's a variation from the standard kelp. And the next standardization will be 4 kilobits per second. My understanding is that it's currently being done at the moment, 4 kilobits. So it will be, become available very soon. And I know over the last many years, many, many companies have submitted this 4 kilobit standard algorithm over the last many, many years. But somehow it failed to meet, the, meet, meet, meet the, all the tests set up by the ITU. They have got certain tests. They check them. And if the algorithm meets that, and algorithm may meet all of the uh, requirements but may fail one of them, then it's not accepted as a standard. So very soon you will have an ITU 4 kilobits per second uh, speech coding standard, and which will have another number here. And these are some of the examples that they normally look at it. They want to make sure, for example, here, your coding delay, basically coder decoder delay, should be in this region, less than or equal to 20 milliseconds. So total Kodak delay uh, should be algorithmic delay is 20, so less than 40 milliseconds. Now, if you have got a more than that delay, then by the time you speak into a mobile phone, by the time it's sent out and received, and the other person won't be receiving immediately. There will be a delay there. So that's why this restriction comes into play, to make sure that's less than 40 delay. Uh, there are coders available which are 60, which are very high quality, low compression, but the problem is the delay is very long, and there's no use to you in a real-time application. So you want to make sure whenever you are de um, designing a, a coder uh, and, and it has to meet these standards, okay? And there are other, other points, and any implementation that you do should be fixed-point implementation for this particular application. Yeah. So low bitrate speech coding. It, it is important to develop a low bitrate speech uh, coding system for voice storage, such as voicemail and also voice-driven directory system. And uh, the current uh, standard is, uh, is 4 kilobits per second, which provides you Tall quality speech, which is called a telephone quality, is another name for tall quality, right? The ultimate goal, then say, ah, if you have got 4 kilobits per second compression, 64, we came to 32, 32, we came to 16, from 16, we came to 8, now we are at 4. Once we have reached 4, once it's standardized, what do we do? Where do we go further? Well, the next ultimate goal is about 2.4 kilobits per second and perceptual quality should be same. So people still feel there's lots more redundancy available in the speech. You can remove that, and once you remove that somehow, and then you can compress the data further and further, then you can come up to 20, 20, 2.4 kilobits per second. So we look at the analysis by synthesis speech coding uh, as, as uh, uh, what we call the kelp um, uh, coder. And we look at the theory behind it. What is the theory behind it? How do you do this? So the basic structure of the analysis synthesis the predictive coding is given uh, uh, on the next slide. OK, let's look at the general model for the analysis by synthesis LPC coding. Uh, the model consists of four major parts. First one is excitation generator, and this is the excitation generator. And I want you to understand very clearly because from this basic model only, we developed the major model. Then synthesis filter. So the synthesis filter is your LPC filter, the vocal tract. So if you've got excitation, if you've got a synthesis done, then you get the speech. 
That's the idea behind it. Then you have got your input speech here, and you subtract your synthesis speech and your input speech, correct? So you will naturally would have a connection from here to here because you want to synthesize. You have to uh, you have to get the LPC coefficients from there. And this error, then subtract this, you get an error. And error is being weighted. You minimize the error. You weight the error such that it's, uh, it does a particular function, which I'll explain in a minute. Once you're done the error weighting, and then you do error minimization, by minimizing the error here means you have got optimal coefficients. Optimal value here, optimal value there. That's the idea behind it. So it's a kind of a closed loop system. You can see that. And if you don't have, if you if you don't have the error weighting filter, the quality will be slightly poorer. With the error weighting, it's it's it's, it's much better. I'll explain that in a minute. So this is your encoder part. This part is this part. This part is your encoder part. And in your decoder, what happened? You have an excitation generator. All the parameters has been sent across. You have the same synthesis filter, and then you just generate, and you get your synthetic speech coming out, which is which is a good quality. So, if you think of it very, very carefully, the encoder, which is at the transmitter side, has got this decoder part as part of it. That's the beauty of it. So, you actually know the quality of the speech here is exactly the same quality here. Because this is the block that you have here in the, at the receiver. The receiver blocks are already in the encoder. And we have already tried out what speech is going to come. And we know what's the optimum parameter. And that's the parameter we're going to send across. Okay? So that's the basic structure. So the synthesis filter has got another name. Synthesis filter has got another name called short-term linear predictor, short-term predictor, because we are analyzing speech over a short term and a short time interval. So it's called a short-term linear predictor. So what is a linear predictor? As we said before, the synthesis filter is an all-fold model, and it's called short-term predictor. Why? Because it's computed by predicting the speech sample from the few previous samples. And we are not using <coughs> long, long um, um, frame, small frame, but short-term prediction because current sample is predicted from past 12 samples. So it's called short-term predictor. Then the set of coefficients coming out is called the linear predictive coefficient, which you have already done that in the last chapter. That's the chapter three. And if you look at the synthesis filter in this case, which is the old pole model, there you go. That's your transfer function of the old pole filter. And the coefficients A, K can be computed. I'm just summarizing on what we have done in LPC um, and uh, using linear prediction method. And how does it work? <laughs> you predict the current sample from the past sample by varying this coefficient. That's exactly the linear prediction. I can go fast here because you have done this before. So eventually, you find the error, and the error here is, is this one. Uh, sorry, just made a mistake here. This is your error, or, or this one. And this diagram you have come across before, this is the excitation here. And this is the vocal tract model here. And that's where the speech comes in. And then you have a linear predictor, which is an FIR filter. When you predict it right, these two cancels out, and you get excitation EN. And we have looked at that before. So that's what I'm showing here. For voice speech, the error is going to be train of impulses. For voice speech, what happens is this is excitation pulses. Vocal track, linear predictor cancel the vocal track, so output will be exactly the same as the excitation. And uh, if you're not fully sure about it, just go back to your lecture notes and have a look at it, chapter three. And examples, so a couple of examples, we have seen this before. This is your speed signal after you pass to a linear predictor. These are the errors comes in. And uh, 
basic approach is to minimize the coefficients, and we get the coefficients of a k comes into play. Okay, as we mentioned, we know how to calculate these coefficients, okay? And what's the general model for uh, um, analysis by synthesis? I've already explained. We have just now touched upon the synthesis filter. We have done that. We know how to calculate the coefficients. All you do is you take the speech here and run through an LPC analysis, and you get that, okay? Now we move on to error weighting filter. What's an error weighting filter? Now it's very hard to explain for, some, for students who haven't come across um, uh, masking techniques and, and, and uh, how the human ear perceives uh, how it masks the noise. But having said that, let me, let me try to explain. So we looked at the error weighting filter as next. So error weighting filter, the function uh, uh, of the perceptual error weighting filter, WSAT, is a transfer function we are going to develop, is to reduce the large part of the perceived noise in the coda. So when you are uh, always, a coda has got noise and quantization noise and all other noise, channel noise as well, but leaving quantization noise, and we want to minimize it, right? And what we do is, using the human auditory properties, we push the noise under certain frequency component where the, 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 the auditory system will automatically suppress the noise. That means we won't hear it. So if you've got a noise under different band and, and this particular band has got a high signal strength, and if you somehow move that noise into this band using some technique, what will happen? signal will mask the noise. And that's what the error weighting filter does in this particular case. So we are using auditory masking property. What that says is the noise in the foreman region, remember, foreman region is like this, would be particularly or totally masked by the speech. So if you've got noise here, this is part, that will mask it. But if you've got noise here, you will hear it. So anything in this part of the noise, if you can push it here somehow, then automatically you get a masking. So what people have done is they've come up with a transfer function which does this job. Now we can, we can look at it a bit more clearly. Maybe in the lab when I get time we can run a small simulation to show this, okay? But for the moment, you go into the next diagram, this is your transfer function of auditory, uh, uh, the, the elevating filter, and as you know, this is your FIR filter, that's your predictor filter. Then you introduce a pole filter, and where you are modifying your coefficients in this particular form. Basically, that's and that multiply, right? And this value, gamma, was determined for various speech and various, by analysis, analyzing a data speech. And they find eventually an error spectrum, which is which, which, as I explained to you, pushes all the noise into the foreman region and give you error, error, a very minimum error. Right? It's a flat error. And um, just you can run through this bit more detail. And uh, how to calculate the bandwidth is all explained in this particular equation. And um, even if you don't understand the elevating filter, uh, it doesn't matter. We may run a small simulation later on to show you how the elevating filter. So at the moment, you need to understand here is an error coming in, and error being weighted. That means the noise in there has been pushed under foreman region, and then you get weighted error coming out. Okay. And this is what exactly it looks like for various gamma. It looks like this is your original uh, uh, energy, original um, formant, and depends on the gamma, you push the error under this region. So when you when you when you do that, like you, you this will particularly mask that. Okay, that's that's a very simple explanation. We can just, if I'm you, like what I'll do is I'll take the error weight filter and do a freak set on it, 
and see what the other spectrum looks like. Okay. Next is the error minimization. Next part is the error minimization. Now, how do we minimize the error? Okay, let's have a look at this one. So we're going from block one. We have done this block, and we have done this block. Now we are in this block at the moment. Error minimization. How do we do error minimization? The most common error minimization criteria is the mean squared error criteria. So we use the mean squared error. So the model is uh, looking at the error minimization criteria by passing the error AEN through a perceptual filter first and then minimizing it. So by minimizing the error, what we are saying that we have selected the correct uh, parameters for synthesis filter. And, and we will write the set of equation in a minute, right? The encoder. Let's look at the encoder part. Remember the encoder part? This is your encoder. The whole lot is the encoder part. And this is your decoder. And remember, minimizing this error means you are selecting this parameter and this parameter in order to have minimum weighted error. Right? That means you've got the best parameter. That means the quality of the speech should be good. So we look at the encoder. How, how does the encoder work? Encoding procedures, synthesis filter parameters, we calculate LPC coefficients are determined every 20 millisecond speech. 160 samples, and next frame 160. They're not overlapping. They're non-overlapping frames, okay? Overlapping only used if you're calculating frequency response, or fre uh, analyzing frequency component or using Fourier transform. But uh, for coding purposes, we can overlap. It's all sort of delay there. We want non-overlapping frames for coding purposes. So how do you get the optimum excitation sequence? by minimizing the error, okay. Excitation optimization interval is usually four milliseconds, four to seven milliseconds, and coefficient, LPC coefficients update frame size. So basically, every five milliseconds, like if you've got a 20 millisecond frame, you need to update every five milliseconds. People found if you calculate, uh, a, 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 you can calculate LPC coefficient 20 millisecond, but you need to do some sort of interpolation so that every five milliseconds you have all these parameters. All the parameters, the excitation parameters, have to be every five milliseconds. So they're called the subframe. 20 milliseconds is the analysis frame, but subframes are every five milliseconds. So you've got four subframes from a 20 millisecond frame, and you have to get parameters. So this is the way it is, like, you know, if you look at it, You've got a 20 millisecond frame there. That's the window of 160 samples. You group them into five millisecond subframes. You calculate the LPC coefficients for every 20 milliseconds. You don't calculate for every five milliseconds because it's time consuming. You calculate for every 20 milliseconds and then do interpolation between this frame and the previous frame to calculate every five millisecond the LPC coefficient. So interpolation is a lot faster than recalculating the coefficient. So remember, 20 millisecond frame, you calculate the LPC coefficient, and then every five millisecond you have to update all the values, and the LPC is re, not recalculated, it's just interpolated for every five minutes, based on the previous frames. We call it between the adjustment, adjacent frames that between, uh, between, uh, uh, between frames. So interpolation enables uh, the updating of the filter parameters every five milliseconds, but while transmitting the LPC every 20 milliseconds, without requiring higher bit rate associated with the shorter updating frames. So you, you, you do the updating every five milliseconds, but transmitting the data every 20 milliseconds. So we cannot predict, we cannot do interpolation on the predictor coefficients. You can do interpolation on the, on the, on the reflection coefficient because of sensitivity issues. If you take the predictor coefficient and chop them for a number of bits, then what happens, a stable filter becomes unstable. 
but you want to translate your predicted coefficients into another domain like a reflection coefficient domain or spectral, uh, spectral frequency domain and then do all the quantization there and then you can get your coefficient back. So normally it's done on log area ratio or spectral pairs or line spectral frequencies. We haven't done this um, in, our, in our course, but you can look up, okay? So basically the coefficients have to be interpolated for every five, every five milliseconds from a 20 millisecond values. This is one of the examples of interpolation technique. This is, this, is the, uh, this is your current frame. This is your previous frame. And you use a kind of a weighting factor of delta. And using that, every coefficient ha has been updated. Ah, here, is the, here you can see how the, how the updating is done. Let's say frame number one. How do I get the frame number one? You get 0.75 of previous frame and 0.25 of the current frame. And that's to get the values, okay? And similarly for all the others, and that's how you get your updating. Now we come to long-term predictor, which we haven't come across before. The long-term predictor, short-term predictor is the synthesis filter. This is now long-term predictor. So, what is the long-term predictor? After inverse filtering, what do you get? Remember, we have got a speech coming in, right? And you have got your FIR filter, which is the predictor filter. And if it works very well, your error looks like this. Right? And people thought, right, why don't we use this error and put another filter, which is a long-term predictor, because it, it removes these pulses, these pulses, these pulses, trying to predict the pitch period, so that what's coming out of it then is a noise, because you've removed these pulses. So if you put another cascade here, another box, which is called the long-term predictor, which basically takes this error signal, and remove these pulses and give you noise out of it. And that is called the long-term predictor. So let's have a look at it. So basically, here's your speech signal, voice production, they are speech at that point, linear predictor, linear predictor output. This is a, another predictor, which is similar to this, but it's only one coefficient it has, if you look at it here. But the delay is not one delay, two delays. It could be many delays, and the delay will match between the distance between those two. Somehow, we will find the distance, and that means when you take this error, and then you delay it, and then subtract this, what happens is these two goes out, you will end up with the, just the noise. So we can call this as a pitch predictor. Long-term predictor is pitch predictor because you're trying to find this distance. So that's the pitch predictor. And long-term predictor has got a, uh, you can write the transfer function as B, K, Z, alpha plus K. Alpha is the, is the delay that you want. But people thought, right, instead of having this predictor, we can simplify this predictor if you want it. And by setting alpha is, um, by setting various value, and you can have a three-tap predictor rather than many predictors. You can tap single tap predictor, you can have three tap predictor, two tap predictor, three, so two delays, three delays, single delay. So we will concentrate on a long term predictor with a single delay. So here is your single delay predictor. Remember, this is your predictor, prediction error coming from the LPC analysis. Now we have got a delay here, we are trying to find out what's the delay value, and we are trying to find out what is this value. So that once we know this value, we take this one, comes here, which is this signal delayed and scaled, comes here, and that signal comes in, and they subtract each other, that means this matrix screw is gone, that's gone, because if alpha is correct, they will map on that exactly, and they're just gone, 
and then you get your noise output as well. So this is the one tap predictor because on one delay, it's called one tap predictor. And alpha can take any value between 20 and 144 samples. 20 belongs to 50 hertz, 147 samples roughly belong to 200, 400 hertz roughly. Around that, say 50 hertz. Like. So this is your equation for that point. The equation there, if you look at the difference equations that. Now we look at the, what method do we use in order to get these uh, parameters, okay? So we go back here, we go back into this diagram, go back into this diagram, we find out how do we calculate B naught, how do we calculate alpha? It's a question we need to find out. Okay, let's take the Rn and, and look at the Rn. Now we say we want to minimize the residual. So Rn squared we want to minimize, which is equal to epsilon n, that you are minimizing that. If you are minimizing this with respect to what? Is it with respect to B naught, assuming alpha is fixed? So you do a partial de de uh, differentiation with respect to alpha naught, you get your value of B naught. So now you can say you have calculated B naught, and once you know the B naught, you go back into your original equation of En. Here, go back. This is your En. You know the B naught. B naught is this much. You put it in there. And you get this is your new E naught. And now you have said, oh, I've got B naught and I've got a new E. This is the minimum error. Now I start to change this value alpha, alpha 47, 46, 48, 49, 50, and keep going. And you find for one particular alpha, error is minimized, minimum error. You select that's the alpha that you want, and that is the pitch period. So minimizing that E will give you the uh, pitch period. Minimizing E means you have to maximize that, isn't it right? You take away maximum value from this, you minimize that. And that's the technique. So remember, you have basically, just, just concentrate me. Here's the speech comes in. You put in linear predictor. Linear predictor give you excitation, the, the pulses. Those pulses now go through a, a, a one-tap predictor, which is a long-term predictor, which predicts this amplitude of the errors, which is the excitation, and the pitch period as well. So excitation is pitch period and the amplitude. And after the long-term predictor, what is coming out is the noise. So basically, that's what's come out, okay? So how do you do this? This particular technique has shown you how to do it. Now, we just, uh, what is the now the general model of a linear prediction? Remember we had a pre previously a diagram, we had these two together, these two together, these two were together earlier and these two were together. Now we have separated because earlier we had speech, linear predictor, and error. Now after the error, we've got a long-term predictor, one-tap predictor, and noise coming out. So what we can say is, is look at the process in the reverse direction. You can say now, let's take this excitation. What's the excitation is going to be? Noise at that point. Noise going through the long-term predictor going through the LPC predictor will give you speech. So from now onwards, we can think it that way. So what is the beauty of this, is, this system is, all you have one excitation, which is the noise as the excitation. This analysis of long-term predictor tells you that one, you don't need to switch between voice to unvoice. You would have one excitation, which is noise, passing through a long-term predictor, which predicts you have pitch period as well as the amplitude, and pass into the LPC, and then doing this, and doing error weight steam filter, and error minimization, going back and changing this parameter until you get the correct one. Okay, that would be our, our general long-term predictor. So it was shown above that the pitch period parameters B naught and alpha are calculated directly from the LPC residual. You saw that. I showed you that you can calculate directly from the LPC residual. This is known as the open loop method, right? 
So there's a difference between an open loop method and a closed loop method. Now people develop this method first and then they sort of fantastic. We've got a model which has got excitation as a noise, then a long-term predictor, then a short-term predictor, and synthesized speech. And the long-term predictor value can be obtained by, by doing that particular equation I explained to you. And then this is significant improvement can be achieved when pitch predictor parameter B0 and alpha are optimized inside the analysis by synthesis loop. It should be done in the inside the loop we, instead of calculating on its own, that's what we did earlier, they said, ah, this should be calculated inside this loop and then optimize them. That would be a better optimization. So how do you do that? So they come up with a closed loop method. What is the closed loop method? Okay, let's look at this. This is the closed loop method. This is your WN, it's your weighting filter. And if you write the error equation, En equal to Sn minus Sn cap, no problem. Now, E set is equal to that. That's all right. Now you can say the weighted error is equal to the weighting filter multiplied by the error. Therefore, if you substitute this one in here, you said weighted error is equal to W set minus by S set multiplied by W set multiplied by S cap set. So if you implement that equation, your diagram now becomes this. This is what the original diagram, this is the original encoder that I have. Now I can say, using the previous equation, I can now put the error weighting filter here and in these two places. See? That means original speech is weighted, synthesized speech is weighted, and you subtract them. And then you minimize the error. And this is the equation that I've rewritten there for you. You can have a look at it, how I have obtained, how I have translated this diagram to this diagram. You might wonder what I'm still doing. I am trying to get the kelp structure. That's all I'm trying to do. Well, kelp structure is a complicated structure. How am I deriving from step one to step two to step three? So I'm showing you, early I show you kelp structure start from my analysis synthesis method. I talked about the synthesis filter, which is the short-term predictor. I talked about the weighting error filter, and then I talked about error minimization. Then I said, synthesis filter output is errors, that's the excitation. We want a long-term predictor, which will take out the pitch period and give you the residue, which is the noise. So I put them all together. Then, after putting all together, now I'm considering error weighting filter. In basing, using our transfer function, this error weighting filter does not need to be here, we could put it here and here, and that's what I have done, here and here. That's the elevating filter now. So this is your new structure of the kelp, and from this onward, we need to just keep going. Right, so if this is the new structure, how do we do error minimization within the loop? Like, not doing individually, but within the, through this loop, we, do, we need to do error minimization. Let's look at that as our next uh, uh, equation. So, using this diagram, we can now start to write an equation here. UN, what is UN? It's BN times this simple first order filter. This filter, we have already looked at it. That's your equation, B0 UN minus alpha. B0 is the filter coefficient. Alpha is the uh, pitch period, which you have to estimate. You can assume that we don't know the excitation yet. So we can set the excitation to zero initially, and the UN, the output, will now become that. So initially, if you set the excitation zero, this is to set up the kelp model, and that's what you get, okay? Now you can say, right, what is the synthesized output? Now you can go back here and say, go back to the diagram, what is this going to be? What is this output going to be? Or what is this output going to be? Knowing this and multiplying with this or convolving in time domain, knowing this and convolving with this one or multiplying with this in frequency domain, you get the weighted output, okay? So you can, you can now write that equation as the weighted output is equal to your UI is the input convolved with your um, with the impulse response of impulse response in this case is this one. Go back to the diagram. 
UN convolve with these two together, or multiply with these two, use that to multiply with these two, correct? So that's what I'm going to put it in here. And you said SW N is equal to UI multiplied by this one, and it's a convolution, plus S node N. There's an initial condition always there. Now we have assumed the excitation is zero, so there will be always the initial condition. This initial condition has to be set because you don't know which excitation is right. So we are, currently we have set the excitation to zero to set up the equation. Now you go back and look at your error again. What is the error here? The error here is equal to this one and or this one minus our one. So we go back and write that, and that's what you have got there. SW minus SF. Now we write this equation here. We write that equation, and we start to do minimization because we are writing the equation on the closed loop now. So when you do that, this is your new error, and this is your equation now you get. That's your base input. This is initial condition. Now what do we have to do? We have to minimize this. We need to, we need to, we need to square this and sum them, or that means we need to square this and sum them. So basically, what we need to do is, if I represent the whole lot, that one, by y alpha n, which is basically these two are convolved, correct? Now I get this equation. This equation is my total error going from 0 to n minus 1, and that means this whole squared. There's a squared there. See? That's the error squared. Now we want to get what? We want to get b naught. We are calculating the same as before with respect to, sorry, with res uh, we differentiate this one with respect to b naught. If you do that and if you manipulate, b naught becomes that. And then you have to, what do you have to do? Next step is, okay, let's go in there. You now go and substitute for B naught, and you get EW equal to that and the whole lot. Now you have got a problem. You don't know when this will be minimum. We have calculated B naught already. So to find out when this is minimum, what you have to do, what you have to do is you find out what value of alpha you compute this again and again and again for various value of alpha, and one of the alpha will give you minimum. Maximizing this, maximizing this is minimizing this. Error minimum for one particular alpha. So you will find, once you have found the alpha and B naught, those alpha and B naught that you have calculated, most of the time alpha will be same, but the B naught will be different using this method, which is called the closed loop method, to the open loop method. Open loop method B naught is different from this. And people have found by synthesizing B naught using, synthesizing a speech using B naught calculated by closed loop method gives a better, much better performance than the open loop method calculation of B naught. And you can see here, significant speech quality improvement over the open loop solution is achieved when the long-term predictor parameters, B naught and alpha, are computed using optimization technique. So this is the uh, algorithm. When you, when you implement this in a, in a computer, it's, it's very, very simple. A couple of lines, it's not very big. Looks very big, but it's very simple. So what is the disadvantage of the closed-loop solution? It's the extra computation you need to get that convolution equation that you have. If you look back, you see this convolution equation that you need to calculate backward, and this extra convolution you have to calculate, and that just takes some time. However, a fast procedure to compute this convolution for all possible delays available. People have developed a fast uh, com computation procedure, so you can calculate. As I said to you, B naught, people found B naught must be calculated using closed loop equation, However, alpha, which is the pitch period, can be calculated using open loop method. It's a lot faster. And calculating alpha using open loop and closed loop does not give you that much of difference. Alpha is the pitch period, which, is, which, is, which has to be accurate, whichever the method you use. Where B node is the amplitude of the actual pitch pulses, and that is going to depend on the method. So basically, a basic structure 
to achieve high quality analysis by synthesis LPC coding is this structure. Excitation generator, VN, this one, this one, and minimizing. And use to use closed closed loop method to calculate V node. In order to calculate, you have to use a closed loop method. So from this onwards, actually, the kelp uh, excited linear prediction starts. So we've been setting up for kelp, but we are there now. So what is kelp excitation prediction? Now we, we write the set of equations for that, very basically. We say the residual signal after the short-term predictor, that's after the linear predictor, and the long-term prediction becomes the noise-like, and it's assumed that is a residual can be modeled by zero mean Gaussian noise. So we said in the previous excitation, this is a noise. We can model, because we worked out earlier, from the speech, we calculated speech synthesis, we looked at the output backwards way, and we found after the pitch prediction, this became a noise. Now if we want to produce a speech, what we do, we have noise as an exciter, and we've got a predictor here, and we're gonna add, synthesis filter, if you go through them one after another, you should get a speech. This waiting filter only comes into play purely for error minimization, not otherwise, not otherwise. Your synthesized speech is here. That is your synthesized speech. So people said, okay, if that's the case, excitation is purely a noise, noise excitation, so what vector, what sort of noise we produce? Because we've got 160 sample, every five millisecond you must have excitation, every five millisecond, right? LPC is calculated over one block, 160 sample, but excitation will be every five millisecond, it's called the subframe. So we want five millisecond means 40 samples. So we need 40 samples of noise samples. So how do you do that? So people said, all right, let's set up a code book that's 40 samples, 40, 40, 40, 40 of an array of 40, 40 samples of noise, which is Gaussian noise. We set them up, and depends on the program, it will pick up the one that you want. Well, when I say depends on what you are trying to do, it pick up the appropriate excitation, right? The excitation is then, then, then set up as a code book. So you can look at the code book now, and the next next diagram shows you the code book. What we have done in uh, um, the code book entry, you will say code book is what? This is the code book. That means 40 values of noise samples, another 40, another 40, another 40. We don't know which is the best excitation, so we set it up. We set it up for roughly 1,024 rows, and we have to find. In order to synthesize a 10 millisecond speech, we need to find out what is the best excitation. So we have to pick up the best vector from here. And you have a method to do that. And that becomes the excitation. So if you look at here, from now onwards, what we have done is this excitation generator, we have replaced that by because the excitation, a code book of L length. 40 samples there, 40, and whatever coming out will be controlled by gain because the amplitude of the noise has to change. And this is where you get your excitation. Now, this is being fed here now. So that's removed that way. It's replaced by a code book. And it's a 40 samples of Gaussian vector comes out. Okay? And it is stochastic code book, it's called. It's not a fixed value, so it's co the code book is called stochastic. So that's why the name KELP comes with the code excited, because this is the code book which is going to excite. And you now could ask the question, of which value of the vector you take? Well, this value of K we have to calculate. We need to know for one particular frame which is the best excitation. We have to find. Okay. So if you rewrite that, if you redraw the diagram, the diagram becomes as 
stochastic code book here, and a gain factor, and goes to the long-term predictor, and V naught, here V naught has V naught and alpha we have to calculate. Short-term predictor, we know by doing LPC here, we can get that, and then you get in the size speech. So if you feed this one, one after another, but by knowing this two value, calculating every every five millisecond, and calculating this every five millisecond, and calculating k every five millisecond, selecting the best vector, you can get the best output, which is to have the highest quality. If you do not calculate this every five millisecond, then the quality you get is very 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 it's not it's not high quality. Okay, if we have looked at the code excited linear prediction on the first part of it, now we look at code excision linear prediction. Now, how to replace? We got the stochastic code book. We got the gain part. Right. Now we have got the long-term predictor here, and we know long-term predictor previously what we had, and we now replace the long-term predictor like this. This is your uh, the the gain, and this is kind of a delay line. You say you've got a delay, you have to find out which is the best delay for that particular excitation. So we can say this is a delay delay line. And as I said, we've got a 40 vector coming here, and this will be 40, this will be 40, this will be 40, 40 samples, because a subframe is 5 milliseconds, 40 samples. So this all would have 40 samples. Now you can say, ah, oh, this is also a code book, correct, with starting index from 20 to 147 rather than from 1 to L, but each Vector, each vector would have, each uh, position would have 40 samples here, 40 samples, 40 samples. And have got a gain B node. And it's being added at that point. So we can redraw this diagram using this also as a code book. Okay. So now the LPC diagram changes into different form. And the format, you can read through this, and the diagram. I'm looking for the diagram, it's coming probably next, is this. Yeah, that's the diagram. Can you see this diagram? What I have done is I have taken the stochastic code book excitation as a stochastic code book of 40 noise samples and 40 of them, 40 of them, they're different, different noise samples, and coming out as a vector of 40 samples. Multiply by gain beta, which we have to calculate, which we have to k has to be calculated. K means this is the k values, which position, and that's being fed here. And we had then the the uh, uh, the long-term predictor. I have converted that into 20 to 147 is my location sir because they are the pitch period, and they also have 40, 40 samples here. Their 40 samples belongs to that position. But they have got a delay of 5 milliseconds, remember? Every 5 milliseconds only you want to check the pitch period. So they have got a delay of 5 milliseconds, and here, now you have to work out which k, which pitch period to pick, which is the alpha, and what gain you have to pick, which is the B node, remember? This is the B node now, change into alpha. So this is your new diagram for kelp, going from original cascade at one, two, three, four, into kind of a two code book added together. So in summary, what do you need to have for a kelp coding? You have to have the K value for this, and a beta value for this, and a K value for that, and a G value for that, and add them all together, pass it through your short-term predictor, which is your LPC coefficients, you get a synthesized speech. And if you calculate these values correctly, you're not deciding whether it's a voice to unvoice. We don't know. It could be voice to unvoice, both gives you input. And you will find if it's a voiced, this would have a major input, and this will be a smaller value. This gain could be smaller. Adaptively, we calculate. And using this structure, you can actually have this structure is called the kelp structure. 
uh, with a code book, which is called Code Excited, Code Excited Linear Prediction. And it's a very high quality synthesized speech at four kilobits per second. So uh, 64, uh, kilobit, uh, 64 kilobits per second speech has been compressed by these. Now the question is, okay, let, let me go through further, okay. So final structure will look like this, and a kelp diagram. I have now drawn this, uh, this, uh, this part and this part. I can now write an equation for EWM, and then I try to minimize that. And you will find from the input speech you have to calculate LPC. Don't forget that LPC has to be calculated always every every 10, 20 milliseconds. Now, this is my diagram for kelp structure. So I'm going to use the knowledge of um, um, minimizing error um, in this analysis by synthesis technique. I'm going to write a set of equation here and trying to come up with new set of equation to calculate all these values. So what's the set of equation I can write? Here's the equation I can write. I could write SWN, weight of speech is equal to I take, I go back here, I say that multiplied by that goes in here, that multiplied by that goes in here, these two are added up, convolved with this particular uh, uh, filter. That means that filter convolving with this individually, that filter convolving with that individually. So what does that mean then? These two are, so what I'm saying is this this one multiplied by this one gives here. This one multiplied by this one gives this one. Both are added up. And both of them are input to the filter. That means in filters will be convolved with this input. That's equal to convolution of these two individually and then sum the, summing them up. So that's next equation shows you that. Here is your weighted output, which is the beta is the gain of your stochastic uh, code book gain, multiplied by stochastic index, which sample to pick up, convolved with your synthesis filter, and G is the gain of the adaptive uh, code book, multiplied by alpha, uh, C alpha is the vector for, for that particular, and convolved with HN, plus S naught N. Why do you have the S naught N? That's the initial condition. Because you do not know which excitation is correct. You do not know which excitation is correct. So you're going to calculate all the time different excitation. So always you'll have a different, different initialization conditions. So you must have an initial value, okay? And then if you write that further, and that's your equation, and explain beta is a stochastic gain. I've already explained this one. And now you take the weighted error, weighted array is, the original speech multiplied by the weighted speech. Original speech weighted, multi uh, 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 subtracted, uh, 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 um, so the weighted synthesized speech is subtracted from original weighted speech. So if you combine those equations, you come up with a new equation of this is your overall weighted error. Now you all know that's the error we have to minimize. Now, we can always start to simplify because of the linear equation. We say there's no excitation. We don't have any excitation. So we figure about that, and we use this equation to set up. So the above equation now comes as this, and we have to find out the mean squared error. How do you find the mean squared error? You square them up. Then you are calculating G with respect to, G has to be calculated and minimizing um, uh, EW, so you take the partial derivative. When you do that, this is your new calculation of G, which is the original B naught. Remember we had as a B naught? That's that. And it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated than before. Now that you put that in, back in here, and you get, you want to find the minimum, means you have to maximize this. How do you maximize this? You change the value of alpha, and you keep changing the value of alpha, and you will find for one alpha, this is this is minimized. So that's how you calculate the, the one. Now you go back to the stochastic code book. You now have calculated alpha, you have calculated G, now you replace them whole thing by Pn, and you write the next part, which we set it to zero. So it becomes this, this is your weighted error. Now the squared weighted error now is this one, 
and we want to we want to minimize this with respect to beta. So how do we do that? Same as before, we differentiate with respect to beta, and when you do that, your beta becomes this. And you substitute back in the original equation, this is what your error is. Now, you need to minimize that error. So what you do is you change the value of index k. That means you are changing ck, c1k, c2k, c3. You don't know which k is the best excitation. So by doing that, you will find out the k value that will minimize this. So you have calculated beta, you have calculated k, you have calculated alpha, you have calculated, uh, calculated um, uh, g as well. So all four parameters are calculated using this technique. Implementation of this is very simple. And this is just showing you how to calculate the value of y alpha if you're implementing it. This is not the only method. You can just use this technique to, to calculate uh, y alpha, assuming c alpha node 1, 2 are known. Okay? Once you have done that, your final schematic diagram is this. We have come across this before. So what do we do have? You will have a value for k using that equation. You have got a value for beta. You've got a value for alpha. You've got a value for g. So you select the correct vector from here for that particular frame. Feed them in. Multiply by that is available. Correct vector. We know the k value. Correct vector. Multiply beta. That comes in. Add them up. Pass it through a synthesizer. You get a synthesized speech there. And that's how you get your... These, these parameters have to be calculated using those equations and you get a very good synthesized speech. So basically, what is the code excited linear predictor? As I said to you, you must have code book, two code book. One is called fixed code book, stochastic code book. Other one is called adaptive. Because the reason adaptive means you are calculating the pitch period. You are trying to find out which one it is, and its content changes all the time. Whereas the fixed code book, once selected the noise, it remains the same. You don't change it. Whereas in the adaptive code book, depends on the speech frame and its, its, its content, its vector will be changing, okay? And people have tried several type of um, uh, excitation techniques, structured code book, fast exciting code book, ternary code book, algebraic code book, overlapping code book, there are many of those because KELP was developing back in 1988-89, and up to 95, 96, people were trying various things. And as you know, KELP has been standardized now, so, so uh, the, the algebraic code book has taken a very good place in the standardization, right? But the basic KELP is what you need. The further what you do on the excitation, I'm not doing it here. Once you've understood the basic KELP, you know the structure, it's a matter of changing any of those code books to give refinement and things like that. So it can be seen from the diagram that the kelp coders do not distinguish between the voiced and unvoiced. You don't know whether it's voiced or unvoiced. Automatically, you just keep calculating every five milliseconds. Input speech is divided into non-overlapping 20 milliseconds, 160 samples in a duration, and 10 LPC coefficients are calculated and you can convert them into line spectra. A speech frame is divided into subframes, four subframes, and parameters g, alpha, beta, and k, given by the previous equation, are calculated for each subframe. LPC is only calculated for one 20 millisecond frame, but all the other four parameters, every subframe. So you generate speech for every subframe. So LPC coefficient has to be interpolated to, cal uh, to find out for each subframe. So, uh, you don't calculate LPC all the, every five frames, okay? So at the decoder, 40 samples are synthesized at any one time. That's all you do. So, so if you start to do a kind of a bit allocation, LSP parameters, line spectral pairs, they are the transformed LPC coefficient to LSP because you want to truncate them, you want to quantize them. 36 bits you need. 
three bits for the first coefficient, three bits second, four, and you can see these bits are more sensitive, so you need more bits for 20 millisecond frame. Stochastic codebook index needs k, which is 10 bits, because there's 1,024 uh, levels there. Stochastic codebook gain, they worked out five bits is more than sufficient. Adaptive codebook indices is only a small seven, because seven bits more than enough to cover between 100 and, uh, 200 and, um, 147 to 40, 40 uh, samples. Adaptive codebook gain is three. So if you add them all, you work out, you get 6.8 kilobits per second. That's the basic help when they did very, very first time. Then when they added on conjugate structure, algebraic structure for excitation, yeah, they can brought it down to further down to four kilobits per second. So implementation of the kelp, what you do in order to implement analysis frame, non-overlapping frame, predict a 10 order, analysis method autocorrelation, subframes 20, excitation 5 millisecond, long-term predictor one tab, you can have two tabs, it will be more accurate, long-term predictor 40 sample, adaptive code book is in that region, stochastic code book, these are just uh, values for each, each, each parameters like. So at the end, you can implement kelp. If you are writing a software, you want to write in software, and this is the diagram that you follow, basically. You still use this equation to, to calculate. You have your 160 sample, you find your LPC. You have your LPC coefficient, feed them to get the weighting filter. Weight your signal, you get a weighted filter. Now the LPC analysis feeds them here to get the impulse. This is, this is the synthesis and the weighted filter. We need the impulse response, remember, on the equation. 1A is that and W is that. So you have both together, and if you give if you give excitation, you get an output. And we know we give a zero samples initially to flush everything out in the system, right? That's called the initial condition every time. Then we have code book. Adaptive code book will give you alpha, the vector, and also G. You feed them with the impulse response only, not the weighted filter, and that gives you an output there. Then you have the stochastic code book beta, and all these have to be calculated in advance, and feed it here, and you get this one. If you add all of those together, you get a weighted error. And using the weighted error, you then calculate alpha, beta, gamma all the time for the next, next, next uh, frame. Uh, speech quality measure uh, will be touched upon later on, but uh, one of the measures is that you can actually calculate the signal-to-noise ratio find out the signal power initially, then after reconstructing them, find the error power, and the ratio gives you an indication of how good your synthesized speech is. And when you are calculating signal-to-noise ratio, you normally calculate segmental. So you do frame by frame. You don't do it for the whole speech. You do frame by frame signal-to-noise ratio, and then add them all together and divide them by. So that's, uh, that's, that's what's given here, and we can discuss on the reason behind it later on in a tutorial or discussion class. Basically, that's soul that we have uh, uh, in, in kelp coding, speech coding. I hope I have tried to give you a basic and simple explanation of kelp coding. It's very hard to find all this de uh, detailed de explanation in a, in a, in a book. Uh, all these notes were written by me, and uh, I implemented this particular algorithm myself. By implementing it, I really understood how the kelp coding works. So I have, I, have, I have kind of tried to explain based on my understanding of how kelp works, and that's the basic kelp, and you can develop any further. If anybody's planning to do research on, on speech compression, this is worth looking at further and looking at the current state of the art and then try to implement this algorithm. Kelp coding is already available as software available on the web. You can download them and you can try them out and look at the quality, okay? Thanks very much. That brings to the end of Speech Coding 1. So the next session will be uh, Julian Epps from NICTA. Dr. Julian Epps from NICTA will be taking the next lecture, which is a Speech Coding 2. Okay, thank you.